You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to VanuPodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. Back in the 1960s, Rio came up with the concept of import-export, a form of one-directional isolation where an Avenuan can maintain access to the Survival Society's open but not free trading centers while denying them access to Avenuan's home base. Reason being, an alternative economy did not yet exist, and therefore a lot of necessary products and services were not available in uh, the ethical enclave, in the Avenuan ethical enclave, or in uh, our terms for, uh, for this episode, uh, the Second Realm. Proponents of Second Realms also saw this as being an issue and came up with a similar solution in how to facilitate said interaction with the First Realm, a proxy merchant or an individual entrepreneur specialized in trade and interaction between the realms. So what sort of occupations for proxy merchants exist now and the future? Why is the role of a proxy merchant necessary? And also, what are the significant differences between proxy merchants and Rayo's concept of import-export? I'll uh, cover, cover all this and more uh, in today's episode of the Vanu Podcast. Uh, last thing, real quick, uh, I want to let you know that uh, the Second Realm Book on Strategy audiobook, uh, what this uh, series is based off of, uh, is now available on the LUA site, uh, as well as on Audible and Audible and uh, ACX. If you want to uh, get it for free uh, from Audible uh, ACX, if you sign up for a free trial, just go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR Audio. And if you want to purchase it off the LUA site, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR Audio 2. All of those links will be in the show notes. And uh, lastly, as I mentioned in every episode, if you want to uh, read Hashtag Agora, the incredible piece of Crypto Agora's fiction uh, that contains Second Realms, uh, Second Realm Book on Strategy, and all of these episodes, uh, you can get all those for free at libertyunderattack.com forward slash Second Realm. So I think that's all. Uh, please enjoy this episode, and uh, until so next time. So installment is titled Proxy Merchants, Facilitating Interaction Between the Two Realms. So as we've discussed, it is absolutely necessary that the two realms remain separate. But to rely upon the second realm's economy to start will lead to a subsistence economy. Therefore, some interaction with the first realm will be necessary, at least in the short term. That said, the first realm is quite dangerous, right? The bludgies and the state and all that. Uh, and it'd be wise to have individuals who specialize in import-export. Uh, that's of a new notion. Uh, they are called proxy merchants in second realm terminology and expand far beyond the Vanuan notion. As has been the trend, I'll be reading excerpts from Smuggler and XYZ's book, Second Realm Book on Strategy. If you're digging the series thus far and are interested in the idea of the second realm and uh, building them, it is a must-read, along with the rest of the content available at anarplex.net. These guys are serious. <laughs> they have been for for ten plus years. I mean, these are some really hardcore crypto anarchists. And uh, I would, I would, I would, if I had to guess, some of the fictional content in hashtag Agora uh, is actually um, some of that probably happens in real life. I would say. So these guys are hardcore. Go read the material available at anarplex.net. You will not be disappointed. Uh, rather, I think you'll be quite impressed with. Uh, you know what they're what they're doing over there. Uh, it's all deep web crypto anarchist shit. It's fantastic, <laughs> definitely fantastic. So let's go ahead and get into the definitions here. Proxy merchants are individuals or entrepreneurs specialized in facilitating trade and interaction with the first realm, uh, also known as the status of all society. So the idea here, as I said, um, it would be difficult. <laughs> It'd be difficult, and not preferable, to rely upon the second realm infrastructure um, early on. Reason being, not everything you need will be provided as a service or a product, uh, and also subsistence economy, as I said. So there will be some interaction in trade with the first realm, just as uh, with Rayo's notion of import-export. Uh, he, laid, he laid the foundation for this, uh, I guess, probably 30 years before the second realm folks came around. So proxy merchants would be the one to facilitate that trade and interaction, um, and it would also, uh, you know, make it a lot more, a lot more safe. People could specialize uh, in the uh, in the interaction between the first and the second realm, rather than everyone having to be specialized in, uh, uh, in in that sort of skill, division of labor and all. Right. All right. And the next definition is import export. Uh, and again, this is a Vanuan notion. This is something that Rayo came up with back in the 1960s, or at least he put a name to it. So uh, this is a longer a longer definition, actually a quote rather, and um, I will 
you know, read sections of it, and then uh, or I'll, I'll read the entire thing, and then we'll, we'll unpack it step by step. So, quote, an optimally liberated lifestyle must involve a sort of one-directional isolation. The liberator maintains his access to their open but not free trading centers while denying them access to his home. This requires a skillful blend of concealment and deception, plus perhaps elements of mobility and deterrence. A free man obtains information, techniques, key equipment, and supplies out of the servile society, exporting labor or products in return. And during import-export activities, he practices deception, perhaps carries a driver's license, genuine or faked, perhaps pays some sales taxes he cannot conveniently avoid, but the free man's home base is physically concealed. There he spends most of his time. There he may sleep, imbibe, love, design, build, trade with fellow freemen, and raise children in relative safety from the savages of state. A free man's home must be a figurative castle, end quote. So, so yes, import-export is facilitated by uh, a sort of one-directional isolation, um, wherein a free man obtains information, techniques, key equipment, and supplies out of the servile society and exports labor or products back in return. So you as a Vanuan would import goods and knowledge from the servile society, import those back to your Vanu home base or your second realm uh, in, this, in this regard, and you would export labor or products back out to the servile society. And you would go out to their open but not free trading centers, but they would not come to your Vanu home base. That is a place where you're most invul invulnerable to coercion. Uh, or, again, in this case, the second realm. The second realm is a place where people are autonomous. Uh, they can trade. They can uh, you know, per partake in vices. Um, but they are free, and they're autonomous, and they're secure. Um, so it's very similar to a Vanu home base, only it's more large scale. So hopefully you can see the similarities, similarities between the two ideas. So the proxy merchant, again, uh, individuals or entrepreneurs specialized in facilitating trade and interaction with the first realm. The point here is that uh, they're, they're very similar ideas. Um, but the proxy merchant, uh, there's an individual or entrepreneur specialized in this, whereas with import-export, the liberator is doing it himself. He's, pr he's practicing the importing of goods and knowledge back to his Vanu home base uh, and exporting uh, goods and services back out to the servile society um, since, you know, as, as Rayo discussed, uh, he had to export his labor for temporary jobs, contract jobs, uh, those sorts of things. Um, because there wasn't a Vanu association, there wasn't an, an internal alter alternative economy um, there in the Siski region. So import-export was necessary, just as with the second realm, proxy merchants will be necessary since um, the alternative economy won't exist yet. I mean, it'll take a little time. People have to join the second realm. People have to interact with the second realm before um, that uh, alternative economy can come into fruition. So import-export, the use of proxy merchants is absolutely necessary uh, in both uh, the pursuit of Anu and also in uh, building second realms. Okay, so in second realm book on strategy, they talk about uh, the role of the proxy merchants briefly, not in too much depth, but uh, definitely enough to get the point across. So I'm going to go ahead and read those excerpts, and I'll stop uh, certain points to uh, discuss. First one, quote, Successfully applying tradecraft presents us with two challenges that need to be satisfied. On the one hand, as mentioned above, too much tradecraft can be counterproductive to social cohesion in organization. On the other hand, successful tradecraft is an art that is not easy to master for everyone in every situation, end quote. So if you'll recall, we talked about the philosophy and culture of the second realm, and there will be a culture of the second realm. There will be this sort of social cohesion around autonomy, freedom, peace, all of these things that anarchists find value in, right? They're the, the main drivers for, uh, you know, most folks' abolition of the state is because they have, <laughs> the state is not peaceful. It doesn't respect autonomy and private property, and uh, it's a very violent, very violent uh, uh, institution and, the, and also first realm culture that – that feeds and propagates in this sort of an institution. Tradecraft. Um, we'll talk about this in a couple episodes, uh, so I'll just only briefly touch on it here. But tradecraft is the art of implementing the objective of need to know. It includes anonymity, opaqueness, untraceability, compartmentalization, and deniability. So too much tradecraft or too much implementing the objective of need to know um, is counterproductive to social cohesion and organization. If everyone is running around paranoid, not telling anybody anything, uh, <laughs> then you can imagine what sort of a uh, what sort of a culture that will be. So the idea is to have people who specialize in tradecraft, so that everyone else can live free and practice the culture in the second realm. Not that the not that the proxy merchants couldn't also do that, but they would have an occupation. They would have a job and be providing the service to those who uh, would rather not have the skills to do this, or for those who are all individuals, some people can't do everything. Nobody can do everything. Maybe some folks just aren't cut out for the role of a proxy merchant. 
So um, in regards to tradecraft, um, obviously you can see how these would be, if all these things were practiced by everybody to a really large degree, uh, there wouldn't be really a culture. Uh, there wouldn't be, well, it would be a culture of security, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a, you know, kind of, uh, if you think about the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest, if everyone is implementing these strategies at the fest, um, it would be a little boring. <laughs> and it wouldn't be as fulfilling of an experience. So if everyone at the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest, for example, um, was practicing anonymity, opaqueness, untraceability, compartmentalization, and deniability, um, which, again, we'll cover that in future episodes, yeah, it would be a, a very paranoid sort of culture. And obviously, a, sort of, a, a, certain, a, certain, a certain degree of paranoia is understandable and expected because um, the, two realms are, <laughs> the two realms are completely contrary to each other. They remain separate. The first realm is a very violent, dangerous, uh, dangerous realm, right? So these things are necessary, but to a certain degree where a sort of culture and a sort of, sort of social cohesion uh, could still come into fruition. So let's move forward. Quote, the solution for these challenges is specialization. Entrepreneurs can excel in providing tradecraft services to other actors in the marketplace by providing means of covert communication, opaque trading rooms, untraceable transportation, or insured pseudonyms. This frees other actors from having to unduly invest into these abilities and keeps a culture of paranoia from seeping into everything we do. However, specialization cannot serve as an excuse for anyone to ignore the subject or drop the awareness for its necessity. Uh, end quote. So yes, specialization and division of labor. Uh, <laughs> you know, these, these folks, uh, they, they, they do. Uh, they do, you know, reference uh, Konkin and, and uh, you know, Rothbard and folks like that. Um, so free market economics. Yeah, specialization, division of labor, it's absolutely crucial. So he mentions uh, means of covert communication, uh, opaque trading rooms. So well, actually, let me back up. Uh, providing means of covert communication. I'm not 100% sure what that would look like. Maybe, I guess maybe assisting if there's a, a buyer and a seller, maybe the proxy merchant. Uh, okay, let me let me yeah let me back up. So let's say it's a, a let's say there's a, a buyer in the first realm and a seller in the second realm. Maybe the proxy merchant would um, facilitate some sort of an anonymous encrypted uh, sort of communication between um, the two traders. Um, that might be it. Not 100 percent sure, obviously, but I guess providing communication between folks who, who are buying and buying and selling and securely because again um, there is going to be interaction between the two realms and the security and privacy and safety of the folks in the second realm uh, is something that needs to be emphasized because you don't know who you're dealing with in the first realm they're probably nationalistic statist collectivist violent authoritarians and yeah I mean you don't want to reveal that you don't want to reveal your private information to somebody if you don't have to um, and I don't think there's really many situations where you have to so he mentions opaque trading rooms this was an interesting a uh, proposition by smuggler and XYZ. So the idea is like double blind trading rooms. Uh, so the buyer and seller don't know each other's identity or anything like that, but there's, there's some insurance because they, they have this proxy merchant. There's this, uh, let's say it's a, um, Oh, I don't know, a, a, a private nightclub with uh, a couple of hidden rooms that serve as these opaque trading rooms. And the buyer and the seller would walk in, and they would both agree to some sort of a um, uh, some sort of an insurance where they want to make sure that uh, the buyer wants to make sure he's getting what he want, what he what he's wanting to purchase, and the seller wants to make sure he's paid or uh, paid in whatever fashion they agree to. Um, so there would be uh, a way to facilitate that safe and secure trade without having to reveal identities, and that would be a service provided by the proxy merchant. Next, untraceable transportation. Uh, which this one is uh, is interesting. It kind of reminds me of uh, of, of uh, Paul Rosenberg's A Lodging of Wayfaring Men, where uh, there were proxy merchants in that book. If you haven't read it yet, go freaking read it. It's available at interplex.net for, uh, interplex for free. But there were people who specialized in this sort of thing. If someone was in trouble, if uh, someone was um, was you know doing black or gray market activity and needed to you know relocate, um, these these proxy merchants facilitate that transportation on private jets or uh, you know private uh, private boats, I guess you could say. Um, but a way to transport people out of the second realm. Uh, out of the purview of this of the uh, of the first realm, right? Because if you get a plane, you have to verify your identity, show your passport, show your identification. And uh, that's not good for privacy. So there are there have to be ways for second realmers to relocate themselves around the world safely and securely. And that is a service provided by proxy merchants. Next, insured pseudonyms. Not sure what that 
really means, honestly. And I guess one downside from this book, second round book on strategy, is they could have fleshed a lot of things out. It's only like thirty. It's only like a thirty page book. Uh, so I, I understand why they didn't because they want to leave it up to our imagination, right? Our creativity, our innovation, to figure out how to apply these things. And these are just examples. So. And sure, too, and if you have any ideas what that means, please feel free to, uh, you know, comment on the uh, post on the LUA, LUA website or on Fascist Book. I'd love to hear uh, what your thoughts are on that. So next, next uh, they say, this frees other actors from having to unduly invest into these abilities and keeps a culture of paranoia from seeping into everything uh, we do. However, specialization cannot serve as an excuse for everyone to ignore this subject or drop the awareness for its necessity. So this is something I talked about just a moment ago, that... Just because people don't have to be heavily invested or focused on uh, tradecraft doesn't therefore mean that they can just uh, ignore the ideas of privacy and security altogether. Because, again, the first realm is dangerous, right? And interaction, with, as interaction and facilitation with the first realm is a dangerous activity and a dangerous task. And even, uh, you know, for folks who stay in the second realm exclusively, the first realm is still out there. And they would, they would love to see second realmers tossed in a cage um, or, you know, maybe even worse, killed if they had the opportunity to, to do so. So security, culture, privacy, anonymity, these are aspects crucial to the second realm. So just because you aren't a proxy merchant, just because uh, you don't, you don't uh, help to facilitate these interactions between the first and the second realm, doesn't therefore mean that you can just ignore the subject. They are 100% right here. I'm glad that they mentioned that. Uh, I really, really am. So this next, uh, this next ex excerpt uh, kind of, uh, Something I've already covered, but it's important, so I'm going to cover it again. Quote, another area unique to our situation is the integration into the larger economy. Since a sufficient market size and diversity can only be hoped for in the long run, we are required to interact and integrate with other markets unless we want to find ourselves in a subsistence economy. However, this integration comes, at, or comes with great risk. These facts call for a special career that is especially interesting to people that have not yet found their vocation or who have left their previous vocation and are looking for low capital opportunities, the proxy merchant, end quote. So I want to talk about that first part a little bit more here. So Rayo was 100% correct back in the 1960s. Um, he said that self-sufficiency, they're, they're seeking volume, not self-sufficiency per se, because 100% self-sufficiency um, is, is uh, you know, it's a good thing to aspire to. But it's not the most time, mo time and money efficient things, right? So if you need a, a computer or some other pretty specialized piece of technology um, and you want to be 100% self-sufficient, you have to learn how to do those. You have to learn how to build the computer all by yourself. You have to ma manufacture all the parts. And it would take a lot of time and money, uh, especially just learning how the damn thing goes together, all of the various uh, components of it, and figuring out how you're going to build it, right? That's not really feasible, <laughs> it's just not. And there are a lot of other examples. Um, you know, maybe even just a freaking coffee maker or a, a food processor. These things are, we don't know how these things, uh, you know, operate or put together. Um, generally speaking, we just use them. And we leave that uh, for the, uh, for the uh, people in China who actually, you know, manufacture the, uh, uh, the, the products. So Ray was 100% right about that, that some sort of integration into the larger economy would be, would be necessary, which is why he came up with the idea of import-export or importing goods and knowledge, uh, importing goods and knowledge back to your Vanu home base from the first realm um, and also exporting labor and goods back out to the survival society. So he was, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy, right, that, that he, he noticed this, this necessity very, very early on and the folks from the second realm just built upon it. So uh, the last thing, yes, this integration comes with great, great risk. Uh, this is something Rayo talked about too. <laughs> it's why he chose the wilderness Vanu lifestyle, and uh, that's why they had a you know six months of storable foods and had everything they could possibly need for six months. Because the more you interact with the first realm, the more risk you were put in. So the way that he kind of avoided this was making infrequent trips to the Servile Society to um, to various uh, to the first realm, and. You know, it worked for him. It worked for him, as far as we know. So, this, uh, let me see what we have here for this next quote. But yeah, they're just, they're just laying out the need for the proxy merchant. So let's read this last excerpt, and uh, then we'll uh, continue forward. Quote, a proxy merchant is a bridge connecting the second realm to the first realm while keeping risks at bay. Many ways of bridge building are conceivable, from people who handle exchanges between second realm money and official currencies to shopping and trading agents. We leave it, we leave it to the reader to invent his own niche, end quote. So let's talk about some um, 
some examples of modern day proxy merchants, uh, and also some examples of, of things that could come into fruition uh, in the future. So, the first one, and this is a really interesting example. I think Kyle and I discussed this in an episode of LUA, maybe uh, back at the end of the direct action series two years ago, almost. Damn. But um, so, industrial parks, right? These things are these th- these things are massive. You know, these these industrial parks. Um, like, let's say there's a, a a proxy merchant who is friendly or sympathetic to uh, the second realm, and he wants to do his part in helping people live this sort of a free, autonomous lifestyle. So, let's say he builds uh, uh, underground apartments. You know, uh, off the they're off the building plans, and uh, you know they secretly invent this uh, underground apartment complex. Um, so, second realmers, Venuans, anarchists, Agoras any ideology ideological label you want to put on it uh could rent these place rent these rooms out uh from the proxy merchant and they could be autonomous free secure um that would be their vanu home base so that's one role a proxy merchant could play uh and there is an example similar to that in hashtag agora where it was right at the beginning right, right at the beginning of the book the protagonist uh when he was first introduced to the second realm um the the woman he was with took him to this private nightclub and there was uh it was you know secrets it was it was protected by uh, by security, and uh, they had their own private room in this private nightclub where they partook in vices, hired prostitutes, um, that sort of thing. <laughs> so that was where they exercised their autonomy, uh, and it was a temporary uh, temporary autonomous zone. So the proxy merchant, the nightclub owner, facilitated that interaction between the first and the second realm by having his name on the property title, having his name on all the licenses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one that you guys may be more familiar with, uh, you definitely are familiar with this. I'm sure some of you have used these proxy merchants before. But have you ever uh, heard of people who uh, don't like using uh, the centralized uh, you know, mainstream exchanges because of KYC and regulations and reporting to the IRS and all those sorts of things? Well, how do they get cryptocurrencies? How do they get digital currencies? Well, they get uh, digital currencies through proxy merchants, people who have accounts uh, on those websites and sell to uh, their clients uh, at a premium. So if I were to go through uh, John Smith and he had an exchange at uh, Coinbase disgusting and um you know i wanted to buy some i wanted to buy uh two bitcoins he could uh buy the two bitcoins for me on coinbase sell it to me for 2.1 bitcoins and so we would all be better off in the transaction i could still retain my privacy and my autonomy so that's uh one example i'm I'm sure some of you guys have used that Um, I'm, i'm positive or even just um, you know, reaching out to somebody on Facebook, one of your uh, one of your colleagues or friends, and saying, "Hey, can I buy some Bitcoin from you? I'll send you some money via PayPal." And you send him the money via PayPal, and he sends you the uh, the Bitcoin to your wallet, and uh, boom, you've just uh, interact with a proxy merchant. So there's definitely a need for for these sorts of roles, and uh, I'm going to do a, a and I wish I had Kyle here for this, so we could really flesh out some of these examples of um, other. Uh, you know, potential occupations for proxy merchants. But um, this is something I'll be thinking about because these are occupations that need to be filled. There are people who need to buy digital currencies from exchanges, uh, from privacy destroying exchanges to supply it to us folks that would rather not deal with those uh, really shitty, awful exchanges. So there's definitely a necessity for it. There's definitely money in it. And um, I'd obviously love to hear your thoughts. So what, what do you think uh, are some roles that proxy merchants could play uh, in facilitating trade and interaction with the first realm? So real briefly before I close it out, yeah, this will be a little shorter of an episode, but uh, I want to talk about the core differences between um, the, the two concepts, uh, import-export, the Venuan notion, and the proxy merchant, um, a second realm notion. So a second realm necessarily entails multiple people, i.e. an attempt to create an alternative economy, uh, whereas the Vanuan notion can be done individually. Uh, for example, Ray and Roberta did their own importing and exporting. They didn't have. Uh, they discussed um, having hiring a, a guy with a truck to uh, bring out goods to them. I don't think that ever happened, but uh, they discussed the ideas of maybe having a proxy merchant. But generally speaking, Ray and Roberta did, the, did it themselves. There was no individual. Well, they were the ones that were specialized in importing and exporting. Um, whereas with uh, the second realm, as I've discussed thus far, you don't have to be the one specialized in that because of division of labor. You could hire uh, an entrepreneur or an individual to facilitate that trade with you, um, which would definitely keep you keep you uh, keep you out of harm's way um, more often than not. That's about all I ha- that's, that's about all I have for you. Um, but yeah, the, the role of the proxy merchants is, uh, is extremely important to the aspect to, to the to the second realm because again, there's <laughs> to, rely, to it's going to take some time for the second realm to be developed. It's going to take some time for um, entrepreneurs to come in and offer products and services. There have, there have to be demands for um, 
things before entrepreneurs to come fill that demand. So it's going to take some time, which means that integration between the first and the second realm is necessary. And that is the role of, proxy, of the proxy merchant. And if it's a more individual basis sort of thing, that's the role of import-export uh, in, in pursuing your in, in your pursuing of the new ones. So they're very two similar terms. The only real difference is the scope. Again, second realm is a, a larger, larger sort of focus goal, whereas uh, import-export could be done by two people on a polyethylene agent in the Cisco region.